Climate change is hurting us all, but it's the world's poorest who are paying the highest price. Every country in the world is now facing a problem with climate change. The drought is making our life difficult. We come to school without eating food. It's so serious. There is no water. Right now, COVID, conflict, and climate change have pushed 7 million people in East Africa to the brink of starvation. What can we do about it? Tony Renato is the Senior Climate Action Advisor for World Vision in Australia. I speak to a lot of communities and farmers. So the people closest to the land and those most in tune with the impacts of climate change. And what they're telling me is that the rainfall has become more unpredictable. And so for them, it's hard to know when to plant and in many cases, even what to plant because their seasons have changed so much. They're telling me that weather events have become more extreme. So droughts are harsher and longer lasting. Rainfall events are heavier, leading to more flooding than normal, and in some cases, landslides. And temperatures are higher. It's universal. Almost everywhere I go, people comment on this. Those things have knock-on effects. So what we're seeing is a tendency for more conflict over scarce resources a tendency for greater migration. People have nothing left at home. Children are more likely to miss out on school, more likely to have poorer nutrition, and there'll be less money for medical needs. And the the predictions are, the trends are, it will only get worse. All of the good work that we've done over decades stands to be lost. It, It will unravel if we do not address this issue. I feel very strongly about this. Uh, You're known as the forest maker, but the technical term is farmer managed natural regeneration or FMNR. What is it? How does it work? Why is it innovative? It's innovative, I think, in its simplicity, and it's had an enormous impact way above and beyond my expectations uh, when I initially developed this approach. When you cut down a tree, it's not the end of the tree's life. The stump remains alive and it has the capacity to re-sprout. And so farmer-managed natural regeneration is simply the selection of the stumps that you want to keep and the management of that regrowth so that you optimise growth. It's really, really simple. And in Niger Republic, where I lived, over a 20-year period, it spread to some 5 million hectares. Within just a few years, this concept of farmers having within their means the ability to restore the vegetation, restore the fertility and productivity of their land quickly and at scale and at low cost, it was a revolution. And without planting a single tree, simply by recognising what was there, literally at our feet, caring for it, nurturing it, allowing it to regrow, 200 million trees came back into that landscape. The impact of those 200 million trees without ongoing subsidy or government intervention or World Vision continued action to support it, every year farmers are harvesting an additional 500,000 tonnes of grain simply because of the improved soil conditions and microclimate. Their gross income, the value of what they consume and the surplus that they sell is worth in the order of $900 million every year in the poorest country in the world. Uh, The work that you started in Niger, I think in the early 80s, uh, has now expanded to more than 24 African countries, I understand, uh, including in Ethiopia, where actually it's it's part of some child sponsorship programs with World Vision funded by Canadians, that FMNR is part of that response. 
what do you think is the potential if, as we invest even more in FMNR to alleviate food insecurity, to help build resilience to climate change and other environmental shocks? How can we take this even to a larger scale? Humbo in, in the southern, southern portion of Ethiopia, World Vision entered there in 1984 with the big drought and now infamous famine that followed the drought. And we did a wonderful job. We fed, saved many thousands of lives. For the next 20 years, to one degree or another, we were obliged to give some food aid in that community. The Humbo Community Managed Reforestation Project was commenced in 2006. Six years later, this historically food aid dependent community sold 106 tonnes of grain to the World Food Programme. The World Resources Institute estimates that uh, at the very least there's about 2 billion hectares of degraded land that need restoring. 2 billion hectares. What's the potential? Give me the world. World Vision works in 100 countries. All of them, to one degree or another, are impacted by deforestation. Right now in places like, let's say, East Africa, which is facing a real hunger crisis at the moment, we're seeing what we might think of as, as a crisis of three Cs, climate change, COVID-19, and conflict. How does FMNR fit into a broader response to those other crises? To make the best of a very bad situation, let's use it to build back better. And the other part of the Niger story that I didn't share is the initial kickstart, the, the foot up, if you like, came during famine. There was a lot of misinformation, lack of understanding on the role of trees. People saw trees as competitors with their crops. And, and we needed to work, tread carefully, uh, work gently with people's beliefs, but edge them on to show, just, just try it. And now if I went to Niger with an ax, I would be lynched. People realize that they cannot live, they cannot sustain their families unless there are trees in their landscape. So by all means, address the immediate need, but seize the day, seize the opportunity to introduce necessary changes to the way we manage land and vegetation to build back a better future that's more resilient, more productive, and much, much less likely to plunge back into to famine again. Sometimes it's about getting from scarcity to just enough, but this actually could give us the opportunity to not just to just enough, but to move to abundance. And that's, a, that's an incredible vision, Tony. Any community can do these things. So it's not going to involve them in dependency, in this inferiority complex whereby all good things must come from the West. So it's very liberating. I, I love it. <laughs> What message would you have for Canadians or Australians or people who are watching this to encourage them to care about these issues uh, and to maybe consider taking action? There's so much that we can do. And I, I'm sad, I speak in many venues around the world and I, I see particularly young people, but perhaps older ones as well, who've lost hope. Oh, it's all too hard. Oh, it's, it's so complex and it's too late. That's, nothing could be further from the truth. There's so much that we can do, and there's so much that we should do. I like conserving trees because I'm an environment champion. If we can keep the world green and keep healing the world, then maybe climate change will be something of the past.